Hi class, so I hope you're all doing well. Uh, this week we're going to spend the entire week talking about Mars. So uh, today we're going to start by talking about how our understanding of Mars has changed and where our interest in Mars came from. Uh, Wednesday we'll talk about the physical nature of the planet and the things that make it uh, a likely place for us to search for life. Um, and then on Friday we'll talk about all the searches for life that we've carried out and kind of what our expectations and what we understand so far is, okay? So uh, to start with today, I wanna to talk about how we as a species have become so fascinated with Mars. So in the background here for me is a piece of art uh, by Michael Whelan. Uh, some of you may know he is a very uh, prominent science fiction illustrator. Uh, this is a piece he did to illustrate Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles many years ago. Uh, but I think this piece really kind of illustrates what has settled into uh, the human cultural mindset about Mars, uh, particularly when we think about alien species. Mars was the first place in the universe that we imagined there might be alien species. And what we're going to talk about today is why and what, uh, what those visions of them might be. Um, obviously, in this case, it's not the sort of life you and I have been talking about, where uh, we've been talking mostly about microbial life and kind of primitive forms of life. Here, uh, certainly science fiction imaginings of life have evolved to the point where we're imagining species as complex as we are. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Okay, so I'll start a few slides here. So what I really want to talk about is where our thinking about Mars came from. Okay, so uh, we'll start with um, some early thinking about Mars. Uh, our thinking about Mars is a curious mix of things that we've learned scientifically mixed together with popular culture at the same time. Uh, and then we'll talk about how that really set the stage for what our exploration patterns for Mars and our interest in Mars uh, actually came from. So, Besides the moon, Mars is the only place in the solar system whose surface we can see through a telescope. Uh, most places that we look in the solar system, uh, they are too far away to show any detail. So if you look at Mercury, uh, you know, it's just a little point of light, even in a telescope. Uh, if you look at some worlds like uh, Saturn or Venus, uh, their cloud structure basically shows nothing. So when you look at them through a telescope, they look more like featureless disks. Jupiter's clouds, for instance, certainly show uh, patterns, but it's clear that they are stable patterns and they aren't anything like a planet that has a surface. But when you look at Mars, you can actually see things on the surface and you can recognize them as being the sorts of things you're familiar with when you uh, think about Earth. And you can do this from your own backyard. You can look at Mars, you can see the polar ice caps, which you can see prominently in this image that I'm showing here. Uh, there are identifiable geographic regions that have names because they persist and as Mars rotates, you can see them. So this uh, kind of dark area that you see, does my mouse show up if I do this? Uh, I guess not. Uh, this dark area that you can see here, uh, right in the center of the image that looks like a thumb going up through the center of the planet. It. That's called Certus Major, okay? And you can see it as Mars rotates all the time. Uh, Mars shows albedo changes over time. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in particular, it also shows weather uh, in many different forms. So in this image, you can see weather here, uh, the kind of bright spot off on the right side, that is high altitude clouds uh, around the volcanoes on Elysium. Uh, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image that where you can actually see these clouds. There are weather patterns you can see from Earth with a backyard telescope, but these, the weather in this particular image you can't. Uh, you need Hubble to see these sorts of clouds. Okay? So let's talk about some of these things. So albedo changes. So in the top row there, uh, Mars rotates. Uh, and as we'll uh, discuss in the second half of today's lecture, it rotates almost exactly the same period that the Earth rotates. Okay, it stays just a little bit longer than ours. But these three images are taken uh, roughly two hours apart. Uh, 
And so what you can see is the planet slowly rotates. And so the bright and dark patterns that you see on the surface of Mars uh, change as the, as the planet rotates. This is one of the things that allows you to identify geographical features on the surface of Mars from Earth. And so uh, long ago, uh, in the early 1900s and late 1800s, when observations of Mars started, uh, we started naming features on Mars because they uh, uh, could, could be tracked. Uh, all the time as the planet rotated. Now, surprisingly on Mars, there are major changes in albedo that occur sometimes. So albedo, uh, sorry, I used that term without defining it. Albedo is the reflectivity, the brightness of the planet. So uh, when areas are very bright, we say they have high albedo. When areas are darker, we say they have low albedo. Okay, so down here in the bottom, uh, there's two images shown, one from 1956 and one from 2012. You can see how those images, uh, the quality of the images has changed over time, but you can see here that they're showing roughly the same area of Mars, once again focused on Sirtis Major, which is that thumb you can see there. Uh, in the left-hand image, you can see the uh, North Polar Cap very prominently there. So what you'll notice uh, in those comparisons is in 1956, when you looked to the uh, east of Sirtis Major, there was a dark area called Thoth Nepenthes. So Thoth Nepenthes was a large dark plane on Mars. And uh, shortly after this picture was taken in the early 1960s, it disappeared and became a bright region, as you can see in the 2012 image. Um, we know now that is uh, part of the redistribution of dust across the planet. Uh, which happens because there are globe-girdling dust storms that happen on Mars uh, occasionally. So um, every season, Mars goes through seasons just like the Earth. There are dust storms. Very often they're localized in areas on the planet, but about every three Martian years or so, uh, or so these large global dust storms stir up. Uh, you can see those certainly from Earth. You'll notice that they cover the entire planet. The complete albedo uh, pattern of the planet changes and it kind of looks featureless like uh, Venus does. Um, and so that's what you see here in this uh, Hubble image taken from Earth. So how did all of this telescopic interest in Mars begin? Um, so we've looked at Mars since the very first uh, day we used telescopes in the sky. Galileo was one of the first people to look at Mars, although in a telescope as small as his, you can't really see any detail. Uh, but really detailed observations of Mars started in the 1800s as telescope technology got better and the uh, te uh, telescopes got better at resolving uh, fine detail on planets and things that you're looking at. So probably the most famous Mars observer was Giovanni Schiaparelli. Uh, he was an Italian observer. Uh, and in 1877, Mars went through what we call the Great Opposition. So Mars and Earth are constantly going around the sun and about every year and a half or so, they are close together. And so when they're close together, uh, that's called opposition because in one direction on the sky, there's Mars, here's Earth, and then the sun is on the opposite side of the sky from Mars. And so at the point where Mars and Earth's orbits are as close together as they can get, then that's what we call a great opposition. And so in 1877, Mars was really close to Earth, uh, the closest is it, it ever can be in its orbit. And so Schiaparelli spent a lot of time observing Mars uh, at that time. And so you can see his map of the albedo regions in Mars in the lower half of the image here. And he noted what he called an Italian canali. So you can see the canali in his image. They're the things that look like long wavy lines, rivers or something like that. Okay, so in Italian, canali means channels or grooves. Okay, but when his observations were translated into English, that was promptly changed into the word canal. And as you might imagine, the word canal has a definite connotation to it. We talked very early on in our uh, studies this quarter about the fact that language doesn't always convey what precisely we mean in terms of our scientific observations. Canal in English very definitely implies a constructed channel, something that was made with intelligent design. And so this sparked uh, the beginning of what uh, is uh, the widespread public interest in Mars. 
uh, speculation about life on Mars. Uh, but of course, it also fueled scientific observations because Schiaparelli's uh, observations of Mars were the best that had been done up to that time. And so his feature map uh, was one that other scientists could use and look at um, and compare against their own observations. Now, one of the people who took great interest in Schiaparelli's observations was Percival Lowell. So Percival Lowell was from a wealthy Boston family. Um, he had uh, gotten a degree in mathematics at Harvard, but then spent uh, a lot of his life, about six or seven years, working in a cotton mill uh, as a business person. Uh, and then he did a stint as a diplomat in the Far East, in Korea and Japan. But in 1893, after his stint as a diplomat was over, he returned to the United States and he really adopted his passion for Mars. He had been technically trained as a mathematician and had always been interested in astrophysics. And so he used his influence and his fortune to build an observatory where he could indulge in that passion for observing Mars. And so he went to Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, which he chose because it was far from major cities. It was very high in altitude. The atmosphere was very good uh, for astronomical observations, and it was very dark. Those are all themes that we look for when we uh, place observatories in the world today. Uh, but Lowell was the first person to establish an observatory based on that criteria. And so in Flagstaff, Arizona, he established what is now known as the Lowell Observatory. It is still an operating uh, observatory, one of the major observatories in the United States. And in 1896, he installed one of the largest telescopes in the world there, the 24-inch Clark Refractor that's there. And you can see Lowell there uh, observing uh, with the Clark Refractor, and this was one of the main telescopes that he used for his observations of Mars. Now, some of you may also, if you know some of your astronomical history, Lowell Observatory is famous for employing um, a young astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh. And in uh, 1929, uh, Clyde Tompaugh was the first person to observe Pluto uh, from the Lowell Observatory. So, so uh, oh, and this is what Lowell looks like observing through his telescope uh, if you build it now Lego. So Lowell uh, was very taken by Schiaparelli's uh, observations of canals. And so when he observed Mars, he saw canals. He saw lots of canals. So these are... Uh, um, Lowell's early observations and some of his sketches of the canals that he saw on Mars. You see that Lowell uh, observed them to be in a network that they would condense in central locations. Um, and in terms of his maps and what he was seeing, he began to imagine what they might be. And uh, his maps got more and more uh, detailed as time went on. And so he constructed this hypothesis that the canals represented the efforts of a dying Martian civilization. They were using canals to funnel water from the melting polar ice caps to their uh, 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 cities that were slowly drying out in the other regions of Mars, which he imagined were at the nexuses of his canals. Now, he published many books about his observations and his interest in Mars. Uh, the first was in 1895, it was called Just Mars. Uh, in 1906, he published another one called Mars and Its Canals. And in 1908, he professed all of his interests in the possible life on Mars uh, in his book, Mars is the Boat of Life. Now, Lowell's observations were extremely detailed, and you can see the maps and the globe representation of his maps here, and he published them. He did what good scientists should do. He shared them with the scientific community, but no one else could see what Lowell was seeing when they observed Mars. Um, part of that is Flagstaff was chosen as a very good site, and so uh, the observing at Flagstaff was much better than in other places. Uh, and part of that was he had one of the largest telescopes in the world, uh, but part of it was he was seeing things that really weren't there. And so probably the most uh, notable example of that is when the Mount Wilson Observatory, the 60-inch telescope on Mount Wilson, looked at Mars, they could see some of the features in the, some of the places where Lowell's thought uh, there was uh, canals, but they were not straight features the way Lowell showed them uh, at Mount Wilson. They could see they were irregular features, which you and I, if we saw an irregular shaped feature, we would think river valley or, or something that was not natural, or sorry, something that was natural and not actually constructed by uh, intelligent uh, species, okay?
Now, uh, so that that's kind of on the scientific side of things, but uh, there were other people whose interest in Mars kind of settled into uh, the uh, consciousness of the public, uh, and that was in the form of fiction. So the most notable person who uh, produced Mars fiction in this era was H.G. Wells. So H.G. Wells was uh, ultimately trained in uh, biology. Uh, he was a student of Thomas Huxley's, and those of you who know a little bit of your bi biologic history, uh, Huxley was a famous Darwinist in the late 1800s. Uh, Wells came from, uh, I, I guess that we call it middle class then, I don't know, uh, but uh, from a family of, uh, of uh, workers in uh, England. Uh, his family struggled economically, and so uh, when you were young, uh, you would often be apprenticed off to uh, different businesses to try and learn a trade uh, so that you could help in the family economics. He bounced among many different apprentices, uh, apprenticeships when he was a youngster, uh, but ultimately his interest in uh, writing uh, and literature was able to uh, take over. He got some jobs in the educational system um, and eventually became a full-time writer. Now, he's certainly most famous, certainly in the common culture for his science fiction work, which is why we're talking about him today. Uh, but those of you who go study Wells' life and his readings, uh, especially later in his later years, he wrote very extensively about socioeconomic justice. Uh, and a lot of that's driven by his experiences um, as he was growing up. But in 1895 to 1897, he wrote uh, probably one of the most famous science fiction novels, uh, which is called The War of the Worlds. And that novel in 1897 was serialized uh, in uh, the United Kingdom uh, in a magazine called um, uh, Pearson's Magazine uh, in the United States in the magazine called Cosmopolitan, which today um, I don't think they publish any science fiction. So, uh, so The War of the Worlds was one of the very first pieces of of fiction to depict a conflict between humans and extraterrestrial species. Now, uh, in interviews, Wells was describing where the idea for the War of the Worlds came from, and that it was born out of a debate with his brother um, about British policy in Tasmania. So uh, British colonialism and imperialism was still uh, strong and, and healthy at the uh, end of the 18th century, uh, sorry, end of the 19th century. And the British had uh, uh, very aggressively displaced the indigenous people in Tasmania. Now this did not sit well with uh, Wells and uh, certainly is not unrelated to his interest in social justice of the ages. And so when he wrote The War of the Worlds, he was really writing an allegory and he wanted to imagine what would it be like if the tables were turned? What would England be like if they were invaded and displaced by an implacable uh, invader? And so this is where uh, The War of the Worlds came from, as well as imagining uh, what would happen to England if uh, what was done to the Tasmanians was done to men, okay? Now, most people know about the War of the Worlds because of a famous radio broadcast in 1938. So Orson Welles, uh, not related to H.G. Wells, spelled differently, uh, was a uh, noted radio, radio personality. Uh, he had been written up as a young wonderkin of the day. Uh, and so he adapted the broadcast for an evening radio program. Uh, he shifted the location of the broadcast, uh, uh, sorry, of the invasion to the United States and the broadcast was a dramatization of the invasion uh, district played on the radio as if it was a, a news bulletin, okay? And so uh, it was a news bulletin describing the Martian invasion of New Jersey, because I think if you live on Mars, New Jersey looks pretty appealing apparently, right? So uh, famously, uh, the press sensationalized the response of people to this, and you can see the New York Times uh, 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 headline there, radio listeners in panic taking more drama as fact. Uh, so this is kind of the mythology of Wells' broadcast. Uh, it was in a very uh, jittery pre-World War II United States, so Nazi Germany was rising at the time. Uh, the United States at that time was still trying to um, uh, avoid uh, being engaged in such a conflict, uh, and uh, it was still a couple years in the future before uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the ultimate entry of the United States into the into the war. Uh, but but it, the the psychology 
of the country at the time uh, was such that invasion was very much on their mind. And so this is where this, uh, uh, this kind of press description of the response to Wells's broadcast came from. Okay, so all of this mixed together, right? So both the kind of pure telescopic observations of features on Mars and this kind of understanding that Mars is a real place, uh, the kind of interpretation of that by people and the misinterpretation of the description, scientific descriptions of Mars that kind of imply the existence of intelligence, uh, the fictionalization of Mars and the fictionalization of Martian species certainly uh, settled into human imagination. Uh, and all of this has swirled around now in our heads for a century or more and really spawned this kind of very broad general perception of uh, within the uh, general public that Mars is a place we could go, Mars is an interesting place, Mars is a place that might uh, be conducive to the sustaining or in fact the existence of life. So uh, I showed you some uh, sketches of my, from my journal of life on Europa. Here's another sketch in my journal of, of uh, being on Mars. I hope uh, when I get to be 100 years old uh, that people like me and you can go to Mars and I can spend my 100th birthday camping on Mars next to the Spirit Rover. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say here in this half of the lecture. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about exploration, in particular uh, rovers and things, in the next half of today's lecture. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we'll talk about uh, all the things that we've learned about Mars as a planet. Okay, so I hope you're all doing well. We'll talk to you later.